All right, today's lecture is going to be about pattern and texture. And so pattern, you know, is something that we innately know. And I had a really difficult time with this part of the lecture thinking about what really can be considered pattern. But it's basically that the formal elements, line, shape, and color, can be arranged in such ways that they form recognizable patterns. So a pattern is the repetition of a visual element in a regular or anticipated sequence. You can think of a pattern as a template or perhaps a design motif. They are extremely important decorative tools for the artist to use. And we're going to commonly apply these to utilitarian objects, such as ceramics or textile. And this is a page of what's called an illuminated manuscript, which is just a page of religious text that is heavily decorated these were made back as far as the Roman, late Roman Empire and also uh, during the Middle Ages. They were created mostly by monks because those would have been the educated individuals who could do writing. And then you would have a page like this where it might take a group of monks a, a month to create. And these were actually made in what were called scriptoriums. Sometimes patterns can be just very subtly placed. Like here we have the square or even diamond pattern on the floor. And we see that repeated not only in the back room, but also on the window panes along the back walls. Sometimes the pattern can be the main focal point of the artwork as it is in this case of the carpet sellers. And again, sometimes it can also be very hidden. The pattern in this case is the Harlequin that is walking off to the right-hand side. And here's a better detail of it. This is the image I have on the study guide, The Women of Algiers by Jean Delacroix. And this artist places pattern everywhere. We see it along the back walls, the doorways, the flooring, the carpets, the clothing, and also like the pillows that these women are resting on. Pattern just is everywhere and it exudes from this painting. So we kind of all know what pattern is and I'm going to go ahead and move on to texture because texture refers to a surface quality of a work of art. And there's three types of texture that we deal with as artists. First, we have actual or what's called tactile texture. Then we have visual texture. And finally, and this is the rarest form, subversive texture. So actual or tactile texture is texture that can be felt. And marble is amongst the most tactile of all artistic mediums, right? When we see these marble sculptures, we want to reach out and touch them and see if they're real. Unfortunately, marble is a very, very soft material. And if everyone was allowed to touch the marble sculptures, they wouldn't even have any indications of what they were. It would just be a blob of stone at the end of the day. So Michelangelo is probably the most famous artist to work in marble. And he would actually go to the rock quarries at Carrera and pick out the blocks of marble that he was going to carve. He said that the sculptures he could already see existing within the block of marble. And all that was needed was his tools to set it free. Of course, we're most familiar with the sculpture of David, but what I'm gonna do is talk about this in a later lecture when we talk about the Italian Renaissance. 
I'm going to talk about his first major sculptural uh, commission today, which is the Pieta. And Michelangelo completes this around the age of 25. So this is the Pieta, which is an Italian word for pity, Mary mourning over the body of Christ. The height of the sculpture without the pedestal is six feet tall. It originally is going to sit on the ground at St. Peter's Cathedral, and you would look across and look into the face of Mary, and along with her, look down and mourn the body of Christ. It is amazing what Michelangelo can do with marble. Not only did these look like real figures, but we can see the gentleness of the fingers pressing into the flesh of Christ here. The natural hand fall, and then also the knot that is created with the fabric there looks incredibly lifelike. The problem is though, first of all, Mary looks exceedingly young here. She should be in her 50s, but she looks about 20 years younger. And also the height of Mary is six foot tall while she's sitting. Today though, this sculpture is not sitting on the ground at St. Peter's Cathedral. It is up on a pedestal, it is behind bulletproof glass, and it is there because back in 1972, this gentleman, Laszlo Toth, goes into the Vatican, rushes past the guards, jumps the balustrade, he has a sledgehammer in his hand, and the entire time he is screaming, quote, I am Jesus Christ. He jumps up on top of the Pieta and is able to land 15 hits to it before he's forcibly removed. You can see in the image here that he's broken off the arm, several bashes to the side of the head. Everything's been conserved today, so you can't even tell it was damaged. Laszlo Toth was not even arrested. He was taken to an Italian psychiatric hospital where he spent the next six months. When he was released, he was taken to the airport. He boarded a plane to Australia, and that was the last time anyone had seen him. If he is alive today, and when I'm recording this, it is spring of 2020, he would be in his early 80s. Ancestrally, he is Hungarian. Employment-wise, he is a college professor in geology. I also want to show you what an unfinished work of marble looks like. This is also by Michelangelo. And this was one of the sculptures that was going to adorn the tomb of Pope Julius II, which never got completed. Funds most likely got diverted from this project because this is also during the time that the Pope is rebuilding St. Peter's Cathedral, and this was a very intensive project. The entire full height of this tomb would have been equivalent to a five-story building, and there are at least 40 different sculptures on this tomb. We do have a few of them that are completed at various museums throughout the world. And this is where that was going to be set. Uh, the tomb was going to confront the tomb of St. Peter's right in the middle of the Vatican, uh, or I should say right in the middle of St. Peter's Cathedral in the Vatican. And it would have been just set off center of the grave, which is marked by the baldacchino there. During the time of Pope Julius II, though, the Baldacchino was not there. Uh, this comes about a century later. So this is where it would have stood, and again, completely out of marble, sculpted by Michelangelo. This is what Pope Julius II got for his tomb. It's still pretty good. I would definitely take it. So we have about a half dozen sculptures, a couple stories tall. And this is uh, located in St. Peter's in Vincoli. So when we think back to texture, particularly actual or tactile texture, we do think about sculptures such as these. 
But keep in mind that paintings can also have texture, this actual texture to them. And Van Gogh is really the first artist where we see it prevalent in his works. He creates paintings like Starry Night through a technique called impasto. Impasto means thickly applied paint. Van Gogh would take undiluted paint right from the palette to the brush to the canvas and he would create these images as we see in Starry Night. There is a thickness to it and here is uh, this cake and I, I bring this image in because impasto is very much like the thickness of frosting on a cake. In 1990, which is a hundred years after Van Gogh's death, a lot of his paintings were x-rayed because there was a lot of scholarship on Van Gogh at that time because it was the hundredth anniversary of his death and they found several interesting things about these paintings particularly though because the oil paint was applied so thickly we even had some paintings that were still wet when you think about oil paints they're like the slowest paint to dry and even a thin layer of oil paint officially takes about one year for it to dry so if you were to run your hands over the surface of this painting, first of all, they would arrest you, so don't do that. But you would be able to tell the people in jail or your friends when you got out that this painting had ridges and furrows and a three-dimensional quality to it. This is why I like sending my students to museums is so they can see these paintings in real life because that technique of impasto just does not come through on a slide. This painting, I could tell you, was as flat as any others, and you'd believe me, but when you saw it in person, you'd be all, no, it's three-dimensional, and it's really kind of cool, almost like a lunar surface in a way. Most paintings, though, contain what's called visual texture, and this is our second form of texture. So visual texture is an impression or suggestion of texture where none exists. And so this is very much an illusion, which by the way, most painting is. I mean, that's our idea is creating three-dimensional space and the idea of motion and all of that. We're also trying to recreate texture. Now, when you look at these wonderful Dutch still life paintings, Keep in mind, this is a painting that comes from the richest area of the world in the 1600s. That's why you see so much wealth shown here. You have fruit that has been imported from more tropical Mediterranean type areas. You've got expensive uh, seafood, such as the lobster. You have gold and silver plates. You have instruments rare and exotic animals and everything like that. A bunch of different types of textures here, but this painting is also smooth and glass-like to the touch. So if you ran your hands over the surface of this painting, yes, you would still have to go to jail, but it would be for naught because this painting is smooth and glass-like. It doesn't have that textural element that we see with paintings by Van Gogh. One way of creating visual texture is through the technique of frottage. Frottage is defined as the process of rubbing from a textured surface to form the basis of an artwork. This is what we used to do as kids, perhaps, when we had a piece of paper and a crayon or a piece of charcoal or graphite and maybe over a surface of carpeting or a textured wall you could rub that charcoal over the paper which is on the wall and take that texture away with you so when we look at an image like this all this textural element has been created through frottage and the same thing, probably this one's a little bit easier to, to see and understand, is we have that 
semblance of wood and wood grain that is creating this image. I'm going to show you a little video showing you how it's done and then I will finish telling you about texture. Okay, well there's one mess. Should we try another one? <laughs> And I can tell you that the rope did not work well either. But you can get the idea of what frottage is. Again, it's that textured surface and we're rubbing charcoal in the case of the video or graphite, crayon, anything like that to transfer that texture to the paper. And again, it is a form of visual texture. Also in visual texture, I'd like to talk about the term trompe l'oeil. Now, this is a French term, and it translates into to fool the eye. It deals with visual deception. And we normally try to visually deceive viewers anyway when we look at art, but here it's had a much heightened sense. Objects are rendered in such incredible detail, commonly emphasizing the illusion of spatial qualities. So this is the Church of St. Ignatius in Rome. And as we enter the church, uh, with many churches uh, built of the Renaissance and Baroque age, this is a Baroque church, uh, we walk through and we have a barrel vault, basically a series of arches over our head. So it's not a flat ceiling, it's a curved ceiling. We're walking underneath an arch. And this is what we see as we enter the Church of St. Ignatius. It is an incredible view of St. Ignatius being received into heaven by Christ himself. And again, this is an example of trompe l'oeil because of the amount of detail, 
the sense of space and all of that. So we also have this work done during the Renaissance. This is by Andrea Mantegna. And we have seen this work already when we talked about foreshortening or what was called amplified perspective. And here, as we zoom into uh, the circle, it is just the idea of this incredible spatial view that we have. So this is trompe l'oeil. Again, it's just visual deception to fool the eye. And of course, trompe l'oeil niche is a great example. And this is just a flat painting. If you received any emails about these incredible chalk artists, this is trompe l'oeil as well. And the last type of texture we're going to be talking about is subversive texture. Subversive texture undermines our ideas about the object itself. It's something that can attract us and repel us at the same time. And my example here is by the surrealist artist Merritt Oppenheim, who covers this teacup with the fur of a gazelle. And so, of course, gazelle fur is extremely soft. You want to reach out and almost pet this teacup, but then you realize it's a teacup and you're kind of drawn away from it. The same type of thing happens in terms of its usage. We're going to use a teacup to pour liquid in, but no one's going to want to drink from this type of cup. And lastly, think about the juxtaposition that's caused when we look at people who are famous for drinking tea, like the British. And so you have something that's very refined, something that's very high society. But then we have this fur, and it's the exact opposite. It's that very primal sense of nature. So it is a great example, and probably the only example I'm going to show you of something that has subversive texture. And, you know, now that I'm thinking about it, in real life, when we have like a, a cactus plant, for instance, and it might look soft or it might look beautiful, and then you reach out and touch it and you realize that it's the spines and they hurt. So just an everyday example of that. So with that, that's going to end our lecture on pattern and texture, and I will see you at the next lecture.